Well, we have, uh, over these last few weeks, been on a deep dive through the book of Jonah, no pun intended, uh, as we've walked and worked our way verse by verse. And what we've seen and what we've experienced in this, in this text is that this book packs a punch. It is not the Veggie Tales story that we grew up hearing as kids, right? This is not the, the simple story of a man and a fish. This is, in fact, so much deeper that, uh, that has so much more for us than maybe we even expected on the surface. Take, for example, just the literary style of this book. It's called an inverted story, which means that the characters in the story, the events of the story, are the exact opposite of everything that you would ever expect the story to be about. Take, for example, just the prophet of God. On the one side, you've got the prophet of God who does everything exactly the opposite of what you would expect, of what you would think that a prophet of God would, would do. He, he makes terrible, ongoing, disobedient decisions to very clear direction from God. You would think that since Jonah's a prophet, and he has the privilege of being the guy who hears directly from God to speak then to the people of God, being the very mouthpiece of God, that, that he would have some semblance of normalcy of what to do and the way to do things. You might think that since he was a religious leader in an extremely religious society, uh, being in this position, being in this profession would leave him very well respected, which he would have been. You might think that because he had influence and power and privilege and people respected him, which so many people work their entire lives just to have one person respect them, and yet Jonah had an audience with the king. You would think that he would do the right thing, but because of the inverted story, he does the exact opposite of what we might expect. On the other hand, you've got all of these pagan sailors who throughout the story, make really great decisions. They make great sacrifices. They start to pray great prayers. This is a story that, in essence, God shows up and speaks to Jonah. And can we just say, this? we can pass by this, we can walk through this, we can sprint on by and just miss the fact that God speaks to Jonah just like God speaks today. God spoke to Jonah and said, go to Nineveh, and Jonah said, no, I'm not gonna go. And then everything went south for Jonah. He takes a ship to the furthest point of the known world. He wasn't just a little bit off track, kind of like, oh, I got a little off course, let me get back onto the, the route. No, he was definitive in his disobedience. And Jonah went as far away as humanly possible which frames these two very distinct visions for life. Uh, you, you've got the vision of what God says is best versus what we say and we, what we secretly think is best for our life. Now, before we just position this story as something purely biblical, we've got to remember that we don't approach the truth from Scripture as binoculars, Scripture is not intended to be used as binoculars to judge others' lives by. No, it's intended to be a mirror for us to look and, and evaluate and judge our own life by because, honestly, there's a little bit of Jonah in all of us, which begs the question, how often do we, like Jonah, see God's call on our life as a choice to consider instead of a command to follow? Then God sends a storm. In the midst of all of Jonah's disobedience, in the midst of all of the running from God and everything that God had for him, God sends a storm and it just reveals the character and the nature of God and his sovereignty. The text doesn't say that God allowed a little bit of rain. No, this was the storm of the century. It was a storm so bad that all of these rough and gruff and tough sailors who had spent their entire life on the ocean were completely panicked to the point that they threw all of the things that, that, that had cost them money overboard. They threw all of the things that would potentially make them money overboard just so that they could survive. It's at this point in the story where 
Jonah's running from God. Jonah's disobedience to God was costing those people around him and causing them suffering, which reminds us that others are always impacted by the choices that we make. It's not just a, a choice of sin and isolation. No, it, it, it hits and, and hits home with other people. Jonah was running. He was living recklessly. He was running headfast into danger, and he started taking people down with him. But instead of taking ownership, taking responsibility for this, Jonah makes the sailors take charge, makes the sailors solve the problem that he created and throw him overboard. And as Jonah hits this icy cold water in the sea, you can just imagine as he starts to sink that he thinks it's the end, but God radically, in the most ridiculous and outlandish way, rescues Jonah by sending a fish to swallow up Jonah in the sea. And it's at this point when he's hit rock bottom, when he's at the deepest, darkest place in his life, in the the midst of all of this overwhelming distress, it's at this moment that Jonah prays. He doesn't repent. He doesn't try to reconcile. He, He doesn't have any remorse, but he does recognize that God's at work. He starts to pray from the belly of a whale. He even takes it one step further, not only praying, but beginning to praise God from the belly of a whale. We saw this last week in chapter two, verse nine, if you've got your Bibles with you. It says this, but Jonah says, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So Jonah in this moment starts to pray, and as he prays, it shifts into this moment of praise where he says, I'll, uh, with a voice of thanksgiving. Now, as he begins to praise, this is a, a grateful, thankful praise that Jonah says and possibly even sings. Now, there are seven words in the Hebrew language that all translate to the one English word, praise. And it's this word here in uh, verse nine is the Hebrew word todah, which is this praise for things not received. It's a a praise of gratitude. And so Jonah in this moment in the belly of the whale was thanking and praising God for something that had not even happened yet. Uh, There was this anticipation that Jonah had. It was an act of faith inside the fish in the darkness when he was still stuck, when he was still submerged in the belly of the fish, when he was trapped. He offers this grateful praise. It's the same type of worship that is found in Acts chapter 16 when Paul and Silas are in prison for preaching the gospel. They're literally shackled and in chains. They've been beaten and abused for telling people about Jesus. And about midnight, it says that they started to praise God in prison. If you remember the story from Acts chapter 16, the the doors bust open, the chains come off of their ankles and their arms, and we can see this happening over and over and over again with this praise and anticipation before there's a breakthrough, there's worship. And not that worship is some formulaic miracle. I'll just sing some worship songs and all of my problems will dissolve away and everything will be just fine if I'm just singing worship songs. No, worship is not a problem solver. Worship is a perspective shifter in our life. It's not some disingenuous religious act that, uh, that, that we start to do in desperation. No, it's rather worship is a declaration that our hope and our trust and our deliverance comes from the Lord. The same thing happens in Second Chronicles in the Old Testament. Uh, God's people go into war, and so as they're preparing for war, the king doesn't send out the army first. No, the king sends out the musicians And the worship leaders, let's say it another way, this is how we fight our battles. When the storm comes, we can trust as followers of Jesus that the battle belongs to the Lord. The battles that we face in life, both spiritual and physical and emotional and relational, these are are battles that God goes before us. And so if you're in the midst of a season of 
darkness, if you feel just submerged by the overwhelming circumstances in your life, God's invitation for you, God's invitation for me is just the same as it was for Jonah. God's invitation is to praise before our breakthrough. Can I just preach for a minute? When you praise God, when you lift your voices, when you're in the darkness, when things in your life are not okay, when circumstances are still resolved, when you worship God, something shifts. There's a shift that happens. Listen, when things are going fine, when everything's okay in your life, it's pretty easy to praise God. When things are going well, when, we, uh, when, when we're okay in our relationships, it's easy to praise God in, with a full heart. But when things are not going well, uh, when circumstances are totally overwhelming, when loss is surrounding you in in every way possible, you have an unusual and specific opportunity to actually do this kind of praise, this kind of worship that is called todah, this praise in anticipation of God working and moving. It's saying, God, thank you that you're in control. Some may trust in horses and chariots. Some may trust in stuff and circumstances, but we will trust in the name of our God because God commands the circumstances of our life, of your life, of my life, just like he commanded the circumstances of Jonah's life. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great British pastor, said this, delayed answers to prayer are not only trials of faith, they also give us opportunities to honor God through our steadfast confidence in him, even when facing the apparent denial of our request. When things aren't going well, when things are tough, we are ushered into this unusual season where we get to demonstrate our trust in God when things aren't going well, when circumstances aren't great, there is still a savior at work in our life. I hear the phrase all the time, oh, God is good, he answered my prayers. But did you know that God answers prayers that don't go our way? Jonah, in the belly of a whale, prays out to God and God answers him, which reminds us and reveals to us that God doesn't abandon those who abandon him. Your life may seem out of control and feel out of control, but Your life is not outside of God's control. God's grace is greater. God's grace is deeper than the darkest parts of your life. And sometimes God's grace doesn't look like better circumstances. It looks like a greater situation that reminds you of his constant presence. The fish for Jonah was not a fish of punishment. It was actually a vehicle of God's protection. Jonah could have just sunk down to the bottom of the ocean, but instead God had mercy on Jonah. This near-death experience where the light, whatever light that is that comes on when people are having this near-death, like it was on full glaring blast. Jonah was at death's door, and then he gets vomited up onto the shore, which is where we pick up in chapter 3. Verse one, then the, Lord, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Our God is a God of second chances, which is good news because we, we all need a second chance, a third chance. Our God came back to Jonah when Jonah wanted nothing to do with God. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Now, none of us would have been surprised in this moment if the story went that uh, this great fish with apparently great digestion vomited out Jonah back onto the shore, and uh, none of us would have been surprised if the next word that we read was Jonah was safe on shore and God gave up trying to talk Jonah into going to Nineveh. None of us would have been surprised in this moment if we see Jonah put in his two weeks notice and resign on this whole prophecy thing. None of us would have been surprised if God had had enough of Jonah's clowning and ratchet living at this moment in the story. 
But no, God is a God of second chances because he came to Jonah a second time. How gracious our God is because Jonah's offered a new beginning that he did not deserve. He's only run. He's only rebelled. He's only come in like a wrecking ball and destroyed everyone around him. But we see this clear picture of our God who is a God of second chances. When it comes to our life, when it comes to the mistakes that we make, the sins that we get sideways with, the times that we're on the run, God has every right to never speak to us again. Sometimes we actually believe this is how God operates, that this time God's had enough with me. That because of this pattern of sin in my life, God's gonna want nothing to do with me. Sometimes we believe this is actually true, like the story of our past is a story that's written in stone, a a story that's written in Sharpie, as if there's just some addendum to scripture that forgiveness doesn't apply to us. Are you kidding me? Because of Jesus, God swaps out all of the Sharpies in the drawer for dry erase markers. Because of Jesus, God swaps out all of the etched in stone for etch a sketch, and our past failures don't prevent God from using us for his future plans. So God comes a second time and says to Jonah, go. He doesn't say to Jonah, pray about it, think about it this time, make sure you think before you act. He doesn't give him any coaching in this moment. Hey, go to a Bible study, have a spiritual conversation with someone over a cup of coffee, because I guess that's what Christians do. And No, there's none of that at all. He says to Jonah, go, and Jonah his response in this moment, verse three, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. Oh, thank God. Can you imagine what would have happened if Jonah said no in this moment? So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go in the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. This is actually and officially the shortest sermon ever recorded. Don't get any ideas. But it's the shortest sermon that we have with Jonah staying the shortest amount of time he could have possibly stayed in Nineveh, uh, this sermon was in English, in the English language, only eight words long. In the Hebrew language, only five words long. So he takes a step, just begins his journey that would have taken across this great city multiple days. Jonah just spends one day, and in a sermon that God has given him, only uses five words. If it were a song, it's not going to be the old song at the tent revival, Come Just As You Are, with multiple, many verses and chorus. No, this would have been the Kesha song, This Place About to Blow. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> right? This is, this is a short sermon, a short stay, but in this tiny sermon, we have huge implications to walk away with. In this short sermon, we see that Jonah still has a pitiful attitude. He's trying to preach the worst sermon of his life. You want me to preach, God? Okay, I got this. Five words, the absolute minimum. He says, this place is gonna be completely overturned. He uses the Hebrew word, hafek which is the word used for the, uh, the same word used in the absolute decimation of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is likely what Jonah was hoping for and intending. This place is going to be completely destroyed. But this Hebrew phrase, hafek, is the same word that David used when he said that God has turned his mourning into dancing. Jonah used it in one way, but we'll see at the end of this story how God uses and turns it for another way. We see first and foremost that Jonah still has a horrible attitude, but we also see this. We also see 
an unwavering commitment to the word of God. God gave Jonah a word, and when God speaks, his word does not return void. When God speaks, his word will accomplish his purpose. It's God's word that changes lives, not my opinion, not my words, not my ideas. And so around here at Mountain View Church, we are going to be people who stand on the unchanging truth of God. There's this reminder of our unwavering commitment by this tiny little sermon that he preaches in just five words. There's no mention of why they ought to turn. There's no instructions on what they should do. There's no how-to on how they should respond, how to avoid utter destruction. No, there's no warning. There's no good news. There's just bad news in his message. Jonah takes a step into Nineveh and says, 40 days and this place is going down. Good luck with that. I'm out. And watch what happens. You you will not believe what happens. Look at verse five. And the people of Nineveh believed God. Are you kidding? They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The biggest, baddest, most evil city on the face of planet. These are the people who invented terrorism. The depth of their inhumanity and cruelty is matchless. Jonah's message was pitiful, but God's love was powerful. There was no match for whatever message that Jonah brought. The Ninevites had made their bed at this point. They can sleep in it. They deserved what they had coming for them for their centuries of brutality and murder and innocent bloodshed that they all celebrated, but God had a message for Jonah, and God has a message for us today that woven throughout history, God's love for a city and God's love for a people is absolutely matchless. His love and his compassion, his grace and his mercy go way beyond any geographic border of Israel goes way beyond the demographic and the people of a certain religion and race and behavior. This is a love of God and from God. It's compassion and care and grace and mercy that absolutely cannot be contained by any generation at any point in history with any people group on planet Earth. Because there is not any person at any point in history who the grace of God can't cover. There's no place on planet Earth or in the depths of the ocean that God's grace does not descend to. The whole city of Nineveh fell on their knees in revival. And it is an act of God, not some persuasive sermon. God breathed on this city and the power of God was put on display. And can I just tell you that central to the heart of our church is this longing to to see God do what only God can do. Let me just tell you, we've got a talented team of pastors and staff. We've got an amazing church family. You guys are great, most of you, but you're great. But I'm telling you, we are desperate for the Spirit of God to move in ways that only he can so that he gets the credit for doing everything in this place. Just like he did with Jonah, Maybe this morning God is prompting you to pray and partner with him, to participate in his divine plan and purpose so that a person in your life would experience the grace and the mercy of Jesus. Can I tell you, God has a really strong track record of reaching people. Is there somebody in your life that God wants to reach through your life? A family member, a neighbor, a coworker, a a friend, Could it be that God is prompting you to be praying for that person and maybe even one step further to pursue that person? Which means we gotta ask the question, do we actually, do I actually, do you actually have a desire to have non-believers in our church? And it sounds like a simple yes. Of course we do. And we say it, but do we live like it? Because I know the temptation for all of us, including me, to make this our personal sanctuary, to make the church sanctuary our personal sanctuary, where on Sundays we get together with people who share our ideologies and 
have the same theologies and they're our friends and family and for a moment, this place is our escape from culture. It's our safe space, it's our refuge and let's listen to all the same positive and encouraging music and wear all the same clothes and slap on the same silly bumper stickers and uh, be weird Christians and wear those shirts. In case of a rapture, this shirt will be abandoned. Bro, take that with you, we don't want that. No. It's a whole lot easier to just stay in our holy huddle and maintain the same friends. The only problem is we can't fully follow God and what he's calling us to if comfort is our highest priority. Isn't it interesting that God didn't send the Ninevites to Jonah? He sent Jonah to the Ninevites. We do everything here at Mountain View we can to have a safe and inviting home for the wanderer and rest for the weary. But we would be so naive to think that all we have to do is provide the place, open the doors, and wait for people to walk through. The Great Commission from Jesus says, go. This is not just a Jonah thing. It's not just a Bible characters thing. This is a Christian thing. We are to go. And the good news is, because we live in South Orange County, we don't have to go across the globe to reach the nations. We can just go across the street. You don't have to be an expert in theology. Build the relationship. Invite someone to coffee. Have them over to your house for dinner. Bring them along with you. Because nowhere in Scripture have I found that Jesus says, if you want to be my followers, take up my mattress and follow me. And it may have been a minute for you in your life or your family or your home that you've interacted with people who don't know Jesus. And so you just stop expecting to be around people who don't have categories for Christ. Maybe, maybe that's the same case here in our church that we've just stopped expecting people who don't know Christ to show up. And so we stop behaving like we're expecting them. Yeah, we genuinely want them and uh, want them to be here, but are we expecting them? And I'm telling you at Mountain View, this Easter, next week, we wanna do everything that we can to genuinely welcome people, like roll out the red carpet of hospitality. Do everything that we can to prepare for people to come. Because when Jesus said, go and make disciples and baptize and teach, We don't believe that he was just talking to the organization or the entity of the church. Jesus wasn't just talking to me because I'm a pastor. He was talking to you and he was talking to each of us. What if Jesus was serious about this? What if going going and making disciples was something that was serious for Jesus? And listen, I realize we get all tangled up in this because none of us like this concept or maybe even the word evangelism. Because simply put, there have been times where evangelism has been hijacked by different entities over time. Where evangelism came to be, came to mean televangelist, or evangelism came to mean going door to door, or standing out on a street corner with a poster, or all of these different things that we all despise. And so there's baggage with this word evangelism, right? But what if we at Mountain View could redefine that word? What if we could make it so simple that it would become so hard not to want to do it? That there's something so simple that we could hang on to? What if there were one person in your life, at least one person in your life, that you simply grieve over that they don't know Jesus? They're not some spiritual project. They're a person who just hasn't experienced the hope and the peace of Jesus. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a family member. And it's not, oh, I hope someday they know Jesus. No, it's literally a grieving process that I love this person. I care about this person so much. And they don't know Jesus. And I recognize the implications both today and today and for eternity. And listen, church family, this Easter, I am praying for a revival to erupt. 
Not because Mountain View is seeking revival, but because we're seeking Jesus. Because we're seeking to wrap our lives around what Jesus is inviting us to. Uh, so that we become so aware of what God is doing and how God is working in our life that we personally live the grace and mercy of Jesus everywhere we go. I'm praying for revival to erupt in this place. It starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with us taking this gospel call to the streets of our neighborhood, to the cubicles of our office, to the homes that we live in. Are you with me? God, may you work in ways that only you can. God, may you begin to work in ways in our heart and in our lives and in our families and in our workplaces that it is undeniable that your spirit is at work within us. God, we are desperate for you. We're desperate for your favor in this place. Would you bring revival Would you bring a a, a passionate, reckless abandon, running after you? And God, would you do what only you can do in my life, in the life of this church, in our community, in this state, and around the world? God, would you work in our lives so that the lives we come in contact with know that there's something different because of how you're working within our own heart. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.